So I'm really proud to announce our next speaker, um, the executive director of the Mozilla Foundation, makers of Firefox, Mark Sermon. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? It's kind of it's kind of weird in here the audio. So t tell me up or or down. Down or up? Up? Okay, down. Oh, like that. Okay. So thanks for having me here. Um, there's nothing as exciting as being in a place like this where I feel like I'm with people who have common cause, who have the same cause that I have uh, and the Mozilla has. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the cause that we all have as Mozilla here at Campus Party, uh, which is wrapped up inside of things like free software, like the web, but I think it's bigger. So I want to talk about that, and I want to talk actually about some strategies for our cause to win over the really, really long term. And, oh, do I have a clicker? No, awesome. So I'm going to be walking back and forth a lot more than I thought. So, you know, I was thinking about causes in, in general. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot over the last year. And one, one time that kind of really a surprising light bulb came on for me is I was here. I was visiting the Royal Society uh, in London. And for, for people who don't know, uh, the Royal Society is sort of a, a champion of science. It's been around a long, long time. Um, has fellows and all these kind of things. I was there talking to them about their computer science curriculum recommendations, getting computer science into the British schools. But the, you know, and that was fun. That was something that I care a lot about. Um, but the other thing that kind of came up for me while I was there is, you know, this is a group of people, and this surprised me, because you know, think about this as an old, stodgy institution that's been around for hundreds of years. This was a group of people who are incredibly idealistic about their cause. In fact, you don't think about science very much as a cause. But this is their, their motto, which is over their door or, or in their, their front hallway. And it says, take no one's word for it. 350 years ago when they kicked off, that was a radical idea. The idea that you know, ask questions, confirm things for yourself with evidence, that wasn't the prevailing ideology. And you know, it, the, the people who I met with, including very senior people like the, the VP of research, still I felt from them an incredible amount of idealism around that concept of science, around asking curiously, looking for evidence. And you know, we don't think of that today because that particular cause has been so successful. It's deeply embedded into our society. But still, there are people who wake up every day idealistically championing that cause. And you know, as I was there, I thought, what would it take for the things that we are excited about, passionate about here today, to still be something that people wake up every day and are excited about 352 years from now, which is how long the Royal Society's been around. So what if the things that we care about still mattered to people, they were still excited. If our cause was so successful that 350 years from now, people still cared about it as passionately as we do. And I think that's a, a question worth asking, and I think it's a thing that we can succeed with. And so that's what I want to talk about today. And I want to talk about you know, what that cause is, some reflections that I've uh, done on it, and how we might describe it to the world. Uh, I want to talk about strategies that we can use for our cause to win, both in the short term and the long term. And I want to talk about that long game idea and the kinds of things I think we need to do and the arc that we need to look at if we want to succeed at the same level as ideas like science. And I think openness and the internet and the web can succeed and shape humanity for that long and that deeply. So let me talk about the, the cause uh, first. One of the great things about uh, working at Mozilla is, you know, I, I showed up about three years ago, and because I have to do all kinds of administrative stuff and legal stuff, I have to go back and read things that are sound very boring, like our corporate charter, our incorporation documents. And in those incorporation documents, it says, Mozilla exists to guard the open nature of the internet. And it's awesome to work for an organization where, like, that's what we're in business to do. 
Um, and, you know, I think we've been fairly successful. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later in the slides. But one thing we haven't been successful at is describing that idea of guarding the open nature of the internet to consumers, to the world, to everybody on the web. Most people don't give a shit. Um, they use the web, they love the web. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is how do you describe that cause better? And I thought back to, uh, you know, to the first cause that I got involved in. This is me uh, in my high school yearbook picture, um, which actually got banned from the high school yearbook because I'm smoking in that picture. Um, and as you may be able to tell from the picture, the cause that I first fell in love with, with was punk rock. And that was a, a pretty understandable cause. The idea of picking up a guitar, making photocopy art, the DIY ethic of punk rock is something that touched hundreds of millions of people. So, you know, why is that and what was that about? How does that relate to, to what we're doing? Well, one of the interesting things about it is that punk rock, like the internet, was a, a cause where the culture and the technology actually fed each other. So I don't know if, if people have ever touched or seen one of these things in the slide, but that's a four-track cassette recorder that let you, you know, I know this sounds very silly in the age of garage band, but like mix four tracks of music together. And what was crazy about that is this was, hi Peter, uh, this was a piece of uh, technology that replaced or let you do what you were only at the time able to do with million dollar studios. So you could make a record or you could make a cassette that could get pressed into a record. The technology was tremendously uh, democratizing, but that also fed, fed the cause, fed the culture of DIY, of punk rock. Another critical technology uh, at that time, of course, is the photocopier. And that was my particular weapon of choice. Uh, I didn't know even how to play a single power chord, so I was not a musician at the time, uh, but I was one of these kind of photocopy poster art uh, kids. And, uh, and so, again, like the fact that you could very cheaply do what up to that point was, was hard and expensive to do, print things, uh, fed this DIY culture, this cause of kind of punk visual art. And it struck me as I was thinking about this, that's not that different than our cause and, you know, than, than some of the things that are powerful about the web. I was in doing that photocopy art literally cutting and pasting, taking glue, taking scissors, and remixing images into you know, other, other art. Remix was at the center of that. And you know, that's what, that was something, as I was reflecting on, which kind of got me to, what's the essence? Like, what turned me on about that? And why does it kind of feel so much like the internet? And the essence, I think, in punk rock and I think it's very much at the core of our cause in free software and the internet, is creativity and freedom. Punk rock was about the fact that we all have an impulse to say something. We all have a voice inside of us that we want to get out. And here, in the era of broadcast television and big, glitzy uh, stadium rock, is a movement that's saying we all can say something, whether we're making a poster or whether we're making a record or just singing along in a club. And that idea of unleashing with freedom, freedom of technology, uh, freedom to express yourself, all of that creativity, I think is a very powerful idea. I think it's what drew, drew me, drew millions of people to punk rock, and I think it's what's powerful about the internet. And how many people, you probably can't see this, but there's this little device here that says 2400 on it. How many people recognize what that is, right? So this is when you're with young people, right? Like 4% of the audience. So that is a modem. And uh, so what that is is, you know, a thing you plug into a landline and it makes this sound like a power cord, you know, in punk rock. They go, and, you know, that was how we all first got on the web, those of us who, who saw those archaic web browsers like Mosaic and Netscape. And, you know, not only does that sound of a modem handshake sound like punk rock, but, you know, there's a lot of that same ethic that was there of DIY as we all got on the Internet. 
as we figured out how to make that modem work, which was a pain in the ass, as we made our first web pages, it was the very same kind of feeling and, and really the same kind of thrill. And what that feeling and that thrill, what that ethic of DIY on the internet created is a really beautiful thing, right? Is this network that now spans two billion people and of which, you know, more than half of are on social networks expressing themselves, posting content, posting photos every day. We live in a world that's very different than the one in which punk rock was born in terms of people's access to creativity and freedom. So, you know, why I bring that up is it's important, I think, to, to understand what our cause is. I think creativity and freedom is a, is a good thing to think about as at the core of it. But it's also really important to understand that we're at a key juncture. We're at a key juncture because there are two different competing visions of the internet right now battling it out to see who wins. And one of those visions of the internet is creativity and freedom. It's open standards, it's free software, it's the idea that we all can use this network for anything we want without asking anybody's permission. There's also a vision of the internet that is very much about prescription and control. We might not call it the internet, you might call it the Great Firewall of China, you might call it ACTA, or you might call it the Apple App Store, but that is a different set of ideas about what the internet should be, and the people behind those ideas believe they're right. They believe the internet should be about prescription and control, about asking permission, about only doing things in prescribed ways. And that vision of the internet might win, right? That's why our cause is so important. It's not just about 352 years from now, it's actually about now, right? We may lose the thing we've built in the last 20 years if we don't describe and build out further that vision of the internet which is founded on creativity and freedom. And of course, you know, that's the vision that I want to have win, but we've got to figure out how we have it win. And it, it's worth just saying one last thing on this question of, of this vision of the cause, which is the stakes for all of us are huge, right? We have bet so much on the internet. Our lives happen on the internet. We fall in love on the internet. We're putting our governments on the internet. We're putting our businesses on the internet. So which vision of the internet wins actually has a lot to do with which vision of society wins. So, you know, to some degree, where the internet goes, humanity is going to go. And so if we believe in a world of creativity and freedom, we need that vision of the internet to win, whether we care about technology or not. And that's what we need to communicate to the world, is the importance of our cause. So how are we going to do that? Um, I think we're already, do we're already making some progress, but we've got a lot, lot of work to do. Um, and I think about the strategy we need as having three things. The first is you know, policy, which is the first thing that comes to mind uh, for most people when you think about having a cause. And it is important. Uh, we saw that with ACTA. We saw that in the US with, with SOPA. You know, policy can wreck, break the internet. Uh, and also, we can imagine policy that can nurture and protect the internet. But I actually don't think that's the most important piece. The other piece that Mozilla has always been strong at is product. A lot of what the internet is, we have shaped just by building things that build in those values of creativity and freedom. And a lot of what's going to wreck the internet is actually product that builds in those values of prescription and control. And so that's another key piece, and I'll talk more about that later. The third piece of the strategy that I think we need, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail because I, I think it's a piece that almost always gets missed, although not necessarily here at Campus Party, is literacy. Is the idea that we need the two billion people who are on the internet, we need the seven billion people on this planet who are quickly through their phones going to be getting on the internet to understand how the web works, and ideally how they can configure it and shape it for their own needs. That is the root of creativity and freedom, the root to creativity and freedom. And the good news is, 
lots of people, people here at Campus Party, uh, but also people like the Conservative Minister of Culture in the UK here, Ed Vasey, uh, are agreeing with me that literacy about how the web works is important. So you probably can't read this, but what Ed is saying here in a quote in The Guardian about six months ago is even a basic understanding of computer coding will help you understand the structure of your digital life. And you see on these shipping carts a lot of the, the same kind of ideas, that understanding how to code is a way to tap into this creativity and freedom. And so I actually think that is the third pillar we need in this strategy if we want our vision of the internet uh, to win. The problem is, strangely, I still get a lot of what the fuck when I say, well, literacy, why is Mozilla, or why do we as a society need to care about web literacy, about code literacy. Um, I personally think it's as important as reading, writing, and math, uh, but we actually need to make that case. And so I'll take a little bit of time talking about that case. Um, the reason I think, and you pr I'll, I'll read this out because you might not be able to see it, the reason I think it's important is the world that, that the web has created, the world of the World Wide Web, is made up of Lego. And we I may understand that here, but it's not something that most people who are on the web understand, and I think that's really important. And you know, you might ask, what do I mean by the world is, is made of Lego? Well, I, I often use my son Ethan, who happens to be right there in the audience, to explain how that, you know, what that concept is and why I care about it. Um, so this is Ethan, and you can come and talk to him afterwards, but he will attest the fact that he loves to make things with Lego. Um, we've got a whole third floor of our house filled with those things. But Ethan also loves the web. He's been sitting over there all day when we're trying to teach him how to do HTML, just sitting on the web. And, um, you know, he loves the web in a way that I think is natural and real and good and common amongst most of those two billion people on the internet. And you know, often I find out about things on the internet through Ethan and my other son, Tristan. So, I don't know if, if people recognize this video. Crank it up. No, it's got to be much louder. Other, otherwise, I'm going to sing. So how, many, how many people have seen this video before? Right. So, for the few of you who haven't, this is, of course, Rebecca Black. I'm going to listen to her lyrics. Oh, everybody's Russian. That's an important line. Um, so, you know, the thing about the stuff Ethan likes on the internet is, if you look at Rebecca Black, there's a kind of a way it's internet-y. It certainly was very viral. But it's actually not different than no matter how old you are, like other pop music that when I was 10, I would have heard on AM radio. Um, so, you know, in, in some ways, while it's awesome that the internet has replaced television and radio, it's not that different. But what is different is the other stuff that, um, that Ethan points out. Is, are we really up on the volume now? Because we need to be able to hear this. So here's something else that Ethan just showed me the other day. 7 a.m. waking up in the morning. Gotta be fresh. Gotta go down. So this is Brock's dub. Uh, and Brock comes out very quickly with these voiceovers. Everybody's Russian. Gotta get down to the bus stop. And and so I asked Ethan like which of these he liked better. And of course, Brock's dub is the one that he liked better and the one that he showed to me. And what's amazing is for hundreds of millions of people, especially the generation of people who are you know, just getting on the internet now, that is mainstream media. Brock's dub is mainstream media, and that is tremendously different than the world that I grew up in, in the world of television, and it's what the internet has brought us. It is maybe corny and crappy and just like cats, but it's also wonderful, and it's very much about and built on creativity and freedom. And another one that, that my other son showed me that is, you know, makes me really happy in terms of the spirit of the, video, the internet is Chad Vader. Yes. Turn my headphones up. Turn them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go, Chad. Oh, yeah. Woo. 7 a.m. waking up in the morning. 
And so, you know, just like with Brock Stub, Chad's got like high production value remixes of Rebecca Black out there right away. And, um, God, I love Chad Vader. Um, and so, you know, this is, look at, there, he doesn't have a back seat. Um, and so, the world that Ethan lives in, the mainstream media world that Ethan lives in, is a mashup. He lives in a world where the language of communication is remix, and remix is mainstream media. And, re and creativity and freedom are mainstream media. That's a very different world. It's a world I like. And it's important to note, and this is why literacy to me is so important, is that that world is a mashup by design, right? By design, we can shape how the world works and have with the internet. And so if you think about the internet being a mashup by design, you know, I actually think Tim Berners-Lee, you can ask him tomorrow, uh, wanted the web to work like Lego. He certainly designed it that way. And so, you know, he designed and others designed a world that allowed us to replace television with Chad Vader, which I'm very happy about. But, you know, more important, he designed that world with Lego that you can go inside and see. So that's the source code of that page, right? And I can go in and see the lines on the Lego. It may look like a beautiful house, but I know I can take it apart. I know I can see how a piece of it works. I know that I can actually you know, shape it and do things with it. I can understand it. I can reuse it. That is designed into the web. And that is unlike any other form of human communication at a mass scale that we have ever had. And it has shaped the world we live in. And I hope it continues to for a very long time. And so that's why I actually care about web literacy. I want Ethan to know that the web is built of Lego. And more importantly, I want Ethan and hundreds of millions of other young people to know how that Lego works. And I think that's one of the most important and most political things we can do for our cause. So, uh, and I, I do think it is the foundation on which we build a world of creativity of freedom. And if we don't take web literacy seriously, and if we also don't look at these other uh, aspects of the strategy, look at literacy, look at product, look at policy, we end up back in the world of prescription and control that we came from, and that we potentially are moving back into. So the, the last thing I want to talk about um, is, l let's say, we, uh, you know, we win at this strategy in the short run. And, and the good news is we're already winning, right? Like Chad Vader is victory. And, and so how do we actually keep winning, win bigger, uh, and last? And so product is a part of that. Literacy is a part of that. Policy is a part of that. How do we make those things last? And I looked a lot at, at other movements and you actually have to look at the, these things on a really long arc to see how you bake your values, bake your ideas into society in ways that last for centuries. And you know, one, uh, one thing to look at in terms of embedding these values is the environmental movement. Um, you know, in addition to being punk rock being my first cause, it's unsurprising that the peace movement and the environmental movement, which kind of went alongside of punk rock, was also something that I was involved in as a teenager. Um, I, or, I, had a, I lived in a little town of 10,000 people where I organized the kind of only peace and environmental group with one union guy and one wife of a minister. And, you know, it's worth asking, if you think about the environmental movement, you know, when did it actually start? And I think people think of it maybe in the 60s or you know, sometime around then. But really, if you look at the history of that and the game and the arc that you know, the environmental movement has played to get to this point, where it's still struggling to survive or to be successful, but it is moving into the mainstream, it really, at least in the North American context, starts, this is a, the, the inside cover of, of Thoreau's Walden Pond. So it starts in like the late, not even quite the late, mid to late uh, 
19th century, where it becomes a conversation about the relationship between nature and humanity, uh, and nature and cities, cities and, and the countryside. And so a lot of the thinking begins then. And this is, I think, probably around 1909, 1910. Um, this, is, this guy, never, never remember his name, but this dude here with the big long beard is the founder of um, Muir, I think is his name, the founder of the Sierra Club. And so you know, it takes like 30, 40 years before you know, Thoreau sitting alone in a cabin turns into a bunch of people gathered and hiking. And what's kind of interesting about that is, you know, you don't think about a bunch of people going hiking as, or camping out at campus party as the environmental movement. But really where it starts in terms of organizing, and the Sierra Club, of course, is a very political organization now in the U.S., where it, you know, where it starts is people enjoying nature, enjoying the environment, just as people who are watching Chad Vader are, or making Chad Vader are enjoying the internet. So that the beginning of that, and actually just like people at, at Campus Party here, the beginning of the environmental movement is really environmental enthusiasts, right? It's not people out there protesting, it's people who love this thing and just want to gather to be enthusiastic about it, much like people are here at Campus Party. And it really takes like another, I don't know, 40 to 50 years before we start to look at the environmental movement as a, a political movement. It's Rachel Carson, Carson's Silent Spring. Uh, you know, it's, it's all kinds of things that happened in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but it's still going on now. But there's no question that this is a powerful and important political movement at that arc in its history. And people keep investing in it, keep reinventing it, keep growing it. And it's really only in the last uh, you know, 10 or 15 years that you start to see those ideas, 100 years later, more than 100 years after Thoreau, becoming a part of the mainstream of how we make economic decisions, um, becoming a part of the mainstream of how we make policy decisions. And we certainly haven't won yet, but along that arc, it is kind of going from the enthusiast to the activist to the market and to the mainstream that happens over a long period of time. And I'm not saying that we actually need to wait 120 years to build openness and creativity and freedom into our society, into the web. We're already doing that. But I think we have to look at investing along arcs that are that long. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that literacy is as important as product. But I think that's what we need if we want creativity and freedom to be a part of our world and the internet's values to be still how we communicate 352 years from now. So a lot of people, though, are impatient. They don't want to wait 352 years. I am one of those people. Um, and so what do we do now? Um, so I'm just going to go through a little bit more on sort of what Mozilla is doing now along those three pieces of strategy. And I think all those three, you know, the things that we're doing tie to everything that's going on here, everything in the free software movement, everything in the free culture movement. There's a lot that we all need to be doing on these three strategies now. Uh, you know, from our side, we've started to move into that policy piece. With ACTA and more with SOPA uh, in the US, we've started to say, this is actually really important. We need to make sure that g legislators don't break the internet. And you know, it probably actually has something to do with le legislators understanding the internet. We'll get there eventually, uh, maybe when Ethan becomes prime minister. Um, so you know, one of the first things that Mozilla did, and it was a big step for us, is we participated in the SOPA blackout um, in the US against the, the US laws that were going to break the DNS system. And I think we'll, you'll see us doing more and more in that area. But of course, you know, the biggest place that Mozilla has played traditionally, and you'll see it continue to happen in the future, is in the product side of building creativity and freedom into the web. And so, you know, Firefox is, is the example you know. And you may know this, but certainly the thing we, most people don't think of when they think about Firefox is, it, you know, it wasn't just a victory for a piece of free software that is a, happens to be on, you know, a quarter of the web, a quarter of the desktops in the world. It really was a victory for the web, right? Web standards, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, the Lego that we build the internet on, were dying. Microsoft was killing them in, 19, in 2003 
when Firefox comes out. The quarter billion people who use Firefox really are just people who are, uh, you know, while they're using a browser they love, contributing to making sure that that Lego stays alive. That's what Firefox is for. That's how we use product. What we want to do next is make sure that the next two billion people who get onto the internet using mobile phones have the same creativity and freedom that all of us have had when we got onto the internet with our desktops. And so we're building something called Boot to Gecko, which is bringing the web into the world of mobile, where it'll be a mobile operating system where any URL is an app. And it brings us back to the level playing field to the world that the web uh, has built. So that's a way in which Mozilla is contributing to the product part of that strategy. And we also, as of January, decided to take a big leap forward on this question of, of literacy. And you can actually go over to workshop one over there afterwards if you want to check out some of what we're building on that front. There's some awesome stuff over there being demoed. And in January, we decided to build, and in June we launched something called Mozilla Webmaker, which is us putting $10 million a year into building products and building programs and building a community that's going to create a generation of webmakers, that's going to help Ethan understand how that Lego works and how to shape the world uh, that he lives in and we all live in. So the first things we've done as a part of that are put out a set of tools that you can use to play with the web, to create things on the web, but also that people can use to learn about how that Lego works. Uh, one of them is called Thimble, which is, you know, just looks like an HTML code editor, but actually has a lot of cool content inside of it uh, that you know, lets people learn quickly about how HTML works. Another is called Popcorn, which is basically, a, a, I, I like to call it an iMovie for APIs, but it's a video editor for the web that also teaches you a lot about how the web works. And on top of those tools, we've started to build a global community of learners, makers, and instructors. Uh, in June, we kicked off something called Summer Code Party, which is, I think we've had 600 of these events where people just get around using tools like that, teach each other how the web works. It's kind of what we're doing over there. Uh, and they've happened in 77 countries so far. So that's a third thing that Mozilla is doing to contribute to this strategy. We're moving into some aspects of policy. We're continuing to push on product with things like Boot to Gecko. And we're really moving into literacy with Mozilla Webmaker. So you know, what I obviously want to see is all of us moving in those three areas on policy, product, and literacy. Um, you know, but there are also this question, what could you do like right, right now? And if you've got your laptop open, um, this is a bit of a, a side thing, but I think it's really important in terms of the kind of things we should be doing, is one thing you could do right, right now is go to freebasil.org and fill in the petition or the letter there. Uh, and Basil, um, I think Sufati is his last name, is a, a Syrian Mozilla contributor, as you can see from his t-shirt, also a, a Creative Commons person, very involved as a coder, very involved as a, an activist for free culture, and very involved in policy. Involved in kind of all the three fronts I talked about, and very much a teacher of other people. And right now, the Syrian government has him in jail because he's somebody who has those skills uh, and has, um, has those literacies. He's not a political person in the sense of you know, why you should be in jail in Syria or the struggle that's going on there. He's a communicator. He's a member of our cause. So one thing you could do now is go and fill that in because I think Basil actually represents what all of us are here for. And he's just a really beautiful human being. So just one final thought to wrap up, and then I'm, I'm happy to take questions on anything related to Mozilla, is, you know, if we want to imagine this long game, if we want to imagine our cause winning, I think we really need to be able to communicate to people. We need to kind of roll up this idea of creativity and freedom. We need to be able to say, this is how the web was designed. And you can't read it at all, but this is a quote from Tim Berners-Lee. And what he says is, the web evolved into a powerful and ubiquitous tool because it was built on egalitarian principles. So he did actually build the web into Lego by design. 
And we need to be able to roll that up. We need a saying. We need something where everyone will remember that. In the same kind of way that the Royal Society has a simple saying that you want to be able to live in a world where you ask questions and gather evidence. We want to say we want to live in a world built on creativity and freedom. And I think if we can do that, I think if we can continue to follow through on the kind of strategies that we're all here doing and that I talked about, we can have a world that's based on the values, on the things that we're excited about 352 years from now. Uh, I think that's actually achievable and what we need to be working on. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Do you want to take this mic? There's a guy in a cape behind you, just, just to distract you while you're thinking of your question. Hey, guy in a cape. He's Flatman. <laughs> Clap for Flatman. Flatman, what are you doing? Promoting the flat rates. All right. Free internet for everybody. Awesome. Free internet for everybody. Um, anyways, there's a guy in a cape. you got to stop for a guy in a cape. Uh, so questions. <laughs> about anything related to Mozilla, although I'm happy to talk about my talk. There's a man with a question. Um, I understand that Mozilla is opening an office in Berlin. That is true. Um, and do you know who is working there or who I could talk to? All those, all those people right there. Put up your hand if you work in the Mozilla Berlin office. All right. I'll talk to them. Yeah. And maybe no, you heard. later on because I play in a punk rock band. and Awesome. Maybe I would love to hear about it or hear it. Um, it there. But we're really, really happy to be here in Berlin. I mean, I, I think everybody here knows it is a place that I think embodies that spirit of creativity and freedom where a lot of cool stuff is happening. So that's why we're here. And also, um, I was wondering about um, the Firefox OS. Um, how is that coming along? I was looking at some sources the other day, but like, do you know any timetables or anything? So there are people back there who I think are better to, to talk, about, uh, talk about it than me, but certainly it is progressing incredibly fast. I think that, you know, we're at an interesting spot, right? I think if you, if you sat back in, you know, 2002, early 2003, um, you really saw the web fragmenting and it was going to be a lot of effort to the point where you kind of got things back. So I think the early versions of Firefox OS are you know, you're going to see them early next year out in the marketplace. Um, but it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a number of years before we actually shift the marketplace back. But I think you can talk to Christian, the man with the red hair behind you, even though he said not to uh, about uh, Boot to Gecko. All right. Thank you. I will. Oh, wait. He's giving a talk at uh, 2 o'clock in this next stage, and he's going to talk about that. Other questions? I have one. It looks like we're questionless. If, if you, oh, is there one over there? No? Okay. Oh, right there. Hello. Uh, I have a question about the Open Badges uh, project. Open Badges. What, a, what would you like to know about Open Badges? Uh, I represent Udacity, so it's kind of free education movement. Uh -huh. And uh, we were looking in, into this project uh, earlier, but it seemed very green. So what's the progress what's on it and the sure. uh, future? Okay, I can, I can tell that. So actually, and you, you reminded me that when you said open badges, I have Mozilla Webmaker button. So if you ask a question, you get a badge. Um, so, uh, you were asking about Open Badges. Open Badges is uh, a part of what we're doing with Mozilla Webmaker. And it's basically trying to create um, an open source, an open standards 
identity system for small educational credentials. So the idea that you would earn a badge to say that you learned something. And the, the reasoning behind that, the vision behind that is on the internet, we're all learning everywhere. Right? You could be learning at a, at a Mozilla Summer Code Party event. You could be learning at Peer-to-Peer -peer University. You could be learning a part, as a part of this free education movement. And you want to be able to collect what you've learned and be able to show it from all of those places. So the idea of Open Badges is to create a standard that anyone can issue educational credentials on any site, and you can collect them all for yourself uh, and you know, pull them together and then take them wherever you want, to Facebook, to your blog, to LinkedIn. And so where we're at in terms of progress with that is the, the, the Open Badges spec and the, and the badge backpack out, are, are out there. So there's a, a metadata specification and there's also a piece of software that allows you to collect and carry your badges around called the badge backpack. So those are out there in beta. You can go and get them, you can use them, you can play with them. Um, those will ship as the final version by the beginning of next year or early in the first quarter of next year. Um, and Mozilla also is developing its own badges as a part of the WebMaker program around HTML, CSS, JavaScript, as well as kind of creativity skills related to the web. And you'll see the first of those come by the end of this year. But I'm happy to talk to you if you have more detailed questions. Um, I'm here. And there's also a bunch of other people who are on the Mozilla Learning team, the WebMaker team at that booth, who can also answer more detailed questions. Um. I was also wondering if you could say something maybe about the um, mobile or post-PC strategy of uh, Mozilla besides Gecko OS. I mean, you have some problems uh, getting on iOS and you will have the same problems on Windows Phone and Windows 8 even. Uh, so. So, so is there a specific question about those problems or you just want to know about our... Um, well, let me, let me give you the big strategy, and then Christian's the guy to talk to about probably the more detailed technical things. So, you know, at a, at a broad level, what we're doing with Boot to Gecko um, is about getting back to the point where any URL is an app, right? That's where we are now. It doesn't matter whether I'm on Firefox or Chrome um, or Internet Explorer, I think they call it. Um, it's not very relevant anymore. Um, you know, I can go and use Facebook or go and use Gmail. It's very different than the, the PC world that we lived in in the 80s and early 90s where if I was on a Mac and you were on a PC, we couldn't talk to each other. We want that to be the world that phones are in as well, and the web can do that. And so part of that strategy is the Boot to Gecko platform. Another is an app specification for HTML5 apps so that you, know, you can have apps that will work across any platform. We're doing a lot of work on web APIs that allow all the components inside of the device to talk to the web uh, and pushing that forward. And then there's another piece around identity, which probably will also tie to commerce, around having open standards for login and identity that work across all your devices. So the, our, our kind of three pillars of mobile are the operating system, the, the app specification and an app marketplace, and an identity system. Be a, uh, there won't be a Firefox browser with, without Gecko Engine. So maybe there, with... There won't be a, a Firefox phone without a Gecko Engine? Is that the question? No, uh, I mean there won't be a Firefox browser uh, with maybe WebKit or... Well, the, the, the <laughs> Axel says no. Um, yeah, but I, I don't think that's the point is what I was going to say because the, the idea is we're trying to build apps that will run on any rendering engine or on any phone and any device. So yeah, we'll still use web. Or, uh, we'll still use web. We'll still use Gecko as our core rendering technology. But the idea is that the web should work across any platform. Um, what success have you had in collaborating with other companies that have a large presence on the web in terms of promoting creativity and freedom? So you know. I mean, the, the first success I think we have is the web uh, or Firefox, and that it, you know has been a platform for other people to build things on. But I think this uh, this current era and those three strategies I talked about, we're really looking for the you know 
different organizations and different partners to, to work with. And so say, if you just look at this Mozilla WebMaker thing, we would, we're talking to, or we're looking at how do we connect into things like Campus Party, or work with companies like O2 that care about this stuff. Um, we're also working with a lot of nonprofits and foundations that are really active in this space, like MacArthur Foundation in the US. Um, so we're still in the process of kind of figuring out how do we strategically do those kind of partnerships. And if you have ideas, um, of who we could work with, happy to hear. And I'm supposed to be giving out badges, I forgot, so I'll give you one. Um, hi, um, I wanted to ask you, how are you progressing with the uh, HTML5 and YouTube kind of conflict? Because uh, you don't want to support any of the proprietary um, video formats, obviously, but uh, are you collaborating with Google on this or? So Chris, Christian's probably a better person to ask about that in his talk because his job is HTML5 evangelist. Um, but, you know, obviously, what I don't know how much in detail you follow it. We made some, some kind of changes around codecs that, uh, you know, that are going to kind of make that easier. But a lot of that kind of falls on Google and YouTube to, to move ahead with. And uh, here's your button. Hi. Um, what do you think about Chrome's native client? Uh, wh what do you think about uh, Chrome's native client? Oh, Chrome. Chrome's native client. Um, so, for, so the question is, what do you think about Chrome's native client? And it's something we've looked a lot at it in terms of game stuff. I mean, obviously, there's a, a bunch of other places that matters. And obviously, we would rather see that not uh, be the way things play out. We would rather see that for the kinds of things that people are doing with native client, that HTML5 actually becomes uh, the way that people do things, like make games. And so uh, there's a bunch of initiatives that, that we'll launch soon that'll show what that could look like, especially in gaming. Thank you. And I wanted to ask, What's going to happen with HTML5 after blogs reported the fragmentation between the Watch WG and the W3C? I, I, I heard half of those words. Oh, sorry. Um, we started reading in blogs uh, that the, there was a fragmentation happening between the Watch WG and W3C respecting HTML5. Right. So um, Christian's again, because he's a kind of HTML5 expert, a better person to talk to in detail about that stuff and go listen to his talk. But, I, you know, I think one of the, the things that um, is different now than at the beginning of the web is that standard setting is a kind of process of negotiation in the marketplace and in real time. And so, you know, I think in broadly what you're going to see is just there is a lot of back and forth before things settle. And I think you're just seeing that, um, you know, that's just one example of that, right? Uh, should we expect things to settle through? I, I think you ex should expect pieces of it to settle soon and other pieces, new pieces to kind of go into flux. I think that's the nature of the speed at which the web evolves and standard setting trying to interplay with each other. There are some important APIs like the storage ones which are changing constantly and I mean they're breaking web apps that are trying to use HTML5. So. It's, yeah, it's that the balance that people are trying to strike and trying to figure that out. I mean, I think everybody wants this stuff to be stable, but you know, people have different visions and they're being kind of negotiated in real time. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested in what Mozilla is doing on web making, over there, we're going to keep that workshop one going for uh, into the lunch break, so go and check it out. And thanks very much.